Come on, yeah, join in the plan. Join the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force for its live stream program, Care, Serve, Protect, on Tuesday, September 1st, 2020, from 7 p.m. The topic for this Tuesday's program is Child Abuse in All Its Forms. Is it being kept a secret? Moderator for the program is Sergeant Jules Morgan. On the panel, Citizen Sergeant of Police Desreen Dez of the Sexual Offences Unit and Miss Juanita Headley, attorney, author and international public speaker. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at SVG Police. Our website address is rsvgpf.gov.vc and on WhatsApp at 1784-485-6891. We welcome your comments, queries and questions. Our citizens, we can't forget as we strive to care, serve and protect. Yes, good night um, to all the viewers once again. We're just having a little technical difficulties with our streaming, but I think that we are back now. And uh, yes, it's running okay. As I said earlier, I have in studio with me Miss Juanita Headley, and uh, she's an attorney, an author, and also an international public speaker out of the US of A. We should have been having Citizen Sergeant Diz from the Sexual Offenses Unit here tonight, but uh, due to unforeseen and uh, seeing circumstances, I should say, Citizen Sergeant Diz would not be able to make it tonight. So it will just be Miss Headley, and uh, I know she's a very capable person and will be able to carry on the program just as good as if it was with another person. Now, we will be having some videos as the program go on, and uh, Miss Sedley would have been speaking with us earlier off camera as to exactly what she has been doing, but we want the viewers to know and hear from her exactly who is Juanita Hedley. Good night to you, Miss Sedley, and Good welcome night. to the Care Self Protect program. I know it's your first time here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and we welcome you to St. Vincent uh, on behalf of the Commissioner of Police and the other members of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force. And you are on our eighth episode of the KSO Protect program. And can you introduce yourself to our viewers as to exactly who is Juanita Hedley? Certainly, and thank you so much for having me. As you've all heard, my name is Juanita Headley. I am a New York attorney, a public speaker, and an author. I've been a licensed attorney for five years. I've been a pro bono attorney. Pro bono simply means volunteering unpaid. As a result of my immigration status, I am originally from England, born and bred Jamaican parents. As a result of that, I provide free legal advice to individuals who are homeless, those who cannot afford an attorney, those who simply need the support, sometimes illegal immigrants and otherwise. Aside from that, I do a lot of work around the world with victims and survivors of abuse, human trafficking. I've also spent time volunteering in safe houses with children who have been rescued from exploitation. My desire is to make a difference around the world. Therefore, I travel and share my message of empowerment on these very same topics. People often use the term awareness. For me, I don't believe in awareness. Awareness in my mind is knowing and doing nothing. My desire is to educate people and empower them with the tools to safeguard and protect their children in the world. At the end of the day, every one of us comes into contact with children, whether we are parents or caregivers. And my desire is for us to all understand signs and identifiers of abuse and trafficking so that we can protect these children. And if they are indeed victims, to enable them to have healthy and whole lives thereafter. As a firm believer in Jesus Christ, I truly believe that all things that the enemy intended for evil, God can turn them around for good. And there are so many survivors and victims of abuse who do an amazing work around the world. Now, you said that you are from the UK. You look as a fairly young person. And uh, how have you been finding time to do all this stuff? I appreciate the question. And, and I laugh because I'm not as young as I look. It was my birthday on Thursday last week, August 27th. 
and I turned 16 plus plus because I never <laughs> disclose my age. I mean, let's be real, when you are of Caribbean or African descent, we do not look our age. We look 10 years or 20 years older or younger. And for me, by the grace of God, despite my youthfulness, I've had great opportunities to travel. In fact, this is country 38. I've been to 38 countries thus far. And by the grace of God, I've had opportunities to serve and be served and to have a lot of life experiences. Asking about how I've managed to fiddle this in, January, I was, November to January, I was working with prostitutes in the United Kingdom. I quit my job and went to Trinidad and Tobago for like two weeks. And then I started working in a safe house in the UK. I quit my job two weeks ago and now I'm here. So there's a bit of a pattern, but for me, I believe that I have important work to do and I'm not motivated by money. I spent around eight years working completely unpaid, traveling the world, almost like a missionary. I have a real heart and desire to change the world one person at a time. And I feel that sometimes in paid employment, that it restricts what I can say and what I can do. We only get four to five weeks holiday a year. And with all the countries that I go to, it makes it impossible for me to continue my work. My desire is to be a full-time speaker. That way my message can go much further than when I'm only spending a few days or a few weeks in a certain place or location. I'm here, Lord willing, until the 10th of September, but my desire is, Lord willing, to stay longer and beyond that, to take this message throughout the other islands because it is so important. And I wish I wouldn't have to quit my job to be here, but it's just one of those things. I say as a Christian that often man can say no, employer can say no, friends, family, spouse can say no, but when God says yes, he will open the door, make provision, and that's what he did, and that's why I'm here. Now, being from the UK, why did you decide to settle in the US? For me, I would say that having spent time in California and Florida, I had a desire to move out there. I studied law in the United Kingdom, and my dream was, in fact, to become a California lawyer. I studied the New York Bar in the UK. I've never studied in the US, and I failed, and I failed again. And on the third attempt, I said to God through Jesus Christ directly, if I do not pass my exams, I'll be a missionary. I pass my exams, I'm kind of a missionary. I've never technically lived in the US. I've been there for four years, but that was six month trips. And so every six months I'd cross the border to Jamaica or Canada and come back inside. And for those four years, I was a volunteer student and then a volunteer lawyer. I never worked, I was never employed. All my work was done for nonprofit organizations with those who are indigent who cannot afford legal services. So I've never lived there and people often mistake and think I'm an American or a US lawyer. Yes, US lawyer, but British citizen, so therefore pro bono, working for free. But like I said, I'm not motivated by money, I just want to help people. But some of my dreams, in fact, are to do so much more than be a speaker. In fact, one of my desires is to build safe houses in the Philippines. Why the Philippines? Because it is number one for cyber sex trafficking. This is when girls and boys are being sexually abused over the internet by their parents, by peers, for a Western man, usually in Australia, let's say Korea, the UK, US. And if it's number one, there's a great need and there's a great reason for safe houses, for the facilitation of places that these children and victims can go to. And one of my other dreams is to build bakeries around the world and hire former prostitutes, former homeless people and ex-convicts. That's my dream. And so although I love to do a lot of work for free, those dreams require tools, resources, money, and things. And so for that reason, I go back to England, I get a paid job, and then I quit. <laughs> I want to make a world of difference, but for me, I realize that money, it doesn't make the world go round, but it is a necessity. And so I speak and share my message, but I want to do so much more, and that requires an income. Now, you are a lawyer, also by profession. You could have chosen criminal law, you could have chosen something in the commercial field, marriage and whatever. Why did you decide to go down that path of helping other persons, especially for bono, and along that line of sexual offenses? Well, the pro bono, of course, is, is a lack of choice, a lack of free will. It's because the laws of the land say that I cannot work and earn an income. And for me, although there is the the pull of working under the table or, or off the table or under the books, you know, there is that pull. Because of my strong faith in Jesus Christ, I'm unwilling to work illegally, immorally or criminally. After all, if I say that I'm a Christian, I have to live that lifestyle. 
Also, with regards to why, specifically, human trafficking, child abuse prevention, I honestly don't know. It pretty much fell into my lap. My desire was to be a criminal lawyer, to go into a courtroom and to be almost as theatrical as some of the criminal lawyers that we see when we watch these documentaries that are on TV or we watch, let's say, live footage of a court case going on. My desire, as is most law students, was to be a criminal lawyer. However, due to circumstances outside of my control, in other words, immigration, that has not happened yet. But maybe one day that will. And for me, I guess my desire is to protect people, protect the most vulnerable. And although when I'm in the U.S., I'm not specifically doing human trafficking related work, I'm helping people who are vulnerable. People who are homeless, who cannot afford a lawyer, who are immigrants, they're vulnerable to exploitation. They're vulnerable to being abused, to being taken advantage of. And so even though they're not children, and even though they're not trafficking victims, they are vulnerable people, and I just like to help. So it's one of those things. I have a heart for helping and for serving, and it just sort of fell into my lap. But if things were different and I had citizenship or a work permit, then I'm sure that I'd be doing criminal law, and I believe that I would also be doing work with children who are victims. So criminal law, but not necessarily sensational cases, but offenses against children. That's something that I'm quite sure I would be doing. Why, why you decided, especially in respect of offenses against children, sexual abuse, um, domestic abuse, emotional abuse, why children? I would say that my desire to help children is because they are the most vulnerable in my opinion. When I read cases of children being abused, often it's by somebody close to them, somebody that they know. Quite recently, I read an article online. Now, I only read the first sentence, so I can't tell you all of what it said. But from that first sentence I read, the young girl was saying how her father was trafficking her. And what she described was that she and her father would go to Disneyland or go to the fun for the amusement park. Then she'd go into the restroom. Her father would leave her. And moments later, a guy would come into the restroom and he would pretend to be looking for his daughter. She'd come out of the restroom. They would hold hands. And then he might buy her candy floss or ice cream, and then she'd be sexually abused. Now, like I said, I read a sentence. like that, That's a long sentence, but I actually forgot to come back and read the rest of the article. But when I read that, it was quite disturbing because it made me think that when we see a man and a girl or a man and a boy with the same ethnic origin, the same features or similar features, we have no idea if a transaction just took place and if that little girl, little boy had not just been sold into trafficking and sold into exploitation. And even recently I saw an article that I perused online and in the article it was about a couple that I believe had been arrested and they had security cameras downstairs in their basement and they'd been selling their daughter for sexual exploitation. And when they were asked why they do that, they said because this was a way for us to make money by selling our daughter on the dark web. In other words, they were making videos and imagery, they were distributing creating child pornography, but also making their child available to be purchased for sex by other men. The worst part of the story, if we can even say the worst part, is that the young girl who was being abused by her mother and father, biological parents, was six months old. And when you hear stories like that, it's a shock to the system if it's your first time hearing it. A six-month-old cannot defend him or herself when their parents are abusing them. And that is why I feel a responsibility and obligation to educate people so that they too can protect that six month old from being abused. Now, can you find exactly what is a child sex abuse? Most certainly. The way that I define it so that it's easy for people to understand is by giving some examples. Now, my message always has to be age appropriate since some of the audience members are around seven and up. So I don't go into too much detail because of the platforms that I often speak in. Sexual abuse can include touching a child over or under their clothing. Sexual ab abuse can also include rape, which is sex. It can include attempted rape, which is not sex. And what some people don't understand is attempted rape is very close to the commission of the crime, but the rape hasn't occurred. When I shared this in Trinidad on one occasion, the people in the audience misunderstood attempted rape. What you have to understand, Attempted rape is not sex, it is not sex. And so if a victim has only been victim to attempted rape, they've never engaged in sexual activity, 
they still have their virginity because attempted rape is not rape. It is close enough to the crime, but it has yet to be committed. It is not mere touching. Another type of sexual abuse is showing a child pornography. Or what if the parents are having sex in another room? That is a form of abuse. What people don't understand is that nudity in front of a child is abuse. And as someone recently said in one of my presentations, nudity is, a, for example, it is pornography in a sense because pornography is either a moving image or a still image of a naked person or persons. And therefore, when you are naked in front of a child, that is indeed a form of pornography. Now, parents get very uncomfortable hearing that statement because parents, mothers particularly, sometimes walk around with no clothes on, no shirt on or whatever. Now, what I always explain is that a mother who walks around with her top off or walks around unclothed, she, I'm going to say this carefully, she is not a pedophile per se, but that's not what we're saying. What I often explain is when a parent, a mother for example, walks around with no clothes on and this mother is not a pedophile, she has sensitized or desensitized her child. So when they go next door or across the road or to another house of auntie or uncle who is a pedophile, the child is used to nudity. Whereas if a parent decides to keep themselves fully covered at all times, when that child goes elsewhere, nudity will be a shock to them, and hopefully they'll come home and disclose. Disclosing abuse is not so simple, not so straightforward, not so easy, but little children often can be quite vocal. And I say that because when I was in a primary school in Trinidad, one of the children shared with me, I think she said, if I can quote her words, my mum takes nude photographs. Another child came up to me and told me another story, and they were just telling me all their secrets because they thought a crime had been committed. Small children often open up a lot, not all the time, but often they do, and the key to getting them to open up about nudity is if you protect them from seeing your nudity, and therefore they would come home, and even if they don't vocalize that they saw uncle or auntie naked, their body language, their behavior should exhibit that something is off. And then hopefully you can ask questions so that you can get to the root cause of why they're behaving a little differently. But if it's normal for everybody to be naked around the house, then when they go next door, the nudity is normalized. And so that is the key. So we're not saying mothers are pedophiles. Sometimes they are. That's not the point. It's about protecting a child from the pedophiles. So that's an important thing to say. Now, in, in those situations, what are some of the indicators that will show that the child is being sexually abused? I would say with small children, for example, some of the behaviors are regressive behavior, sucking the thumb or wetting the bed. Some young girls and boys who've been abused may have flashbacks. In fact, I met a young girl and she told me that she did not know she'd been abused, but she'd had flashbacks. Another girl was in a children's home and she shared with me that the court case documents de detailed that she had been abused by her stepfather from one to six months old. Now, of course, a child who doesn't remember what has happened or maybe is having flashbacks, maybe can't come to accept that the flashbacks is not something that hasn't happened, but is the reality. Some individuals to protect themselves block out what has happened, they don't even know. And although they may be triggered by certain smells or by certain things, they simply don't really know what has taken place. Now with older children, some of the signs and identifiers could be running away from home. What about obesity, low self-esteem, insecurity, insomnia? Now insomnia is a big one. I've met some girls, some survivors of abuse, who all had insomnia and were sexually abused during their sleep. A person who is obese, that does not mean to say every obese person is a victim or survivor of abuse. But when you've been abused, you've lost control, and therefore you eat to control. What about somebody cutting their wrists, suicidal ideation, promiscuous behavior, an individual who is dressing over, overdressing, or underdressing. Overdressing means they're fully covered up. What about somebody who, let's say they're a female, who dresses more as a male? Now, I understand that is slightly controversial, but there are some girls who feel that they need to cover up and hide their body and hide their features because of what they've been through. In fact, I know a young girl who was victim of sexual abuse by about five family members, 
and when I met her, her dress sense was very, very masculine. Now, it's not to say every person who dresses masculine and they're female, it's because they've been abused, but sometimes that is the case. I believe it's important not to judge an individual. Somebody who has STDs or is pregnant at a young age or outside of marriage. Now, when we hear of a young girl or woman being pregnant, we may judge her when the question we need to ask is who impregnated her. I know of a young boy, in fact, who was promiscuous. That promiscuity stemmed from him being sexually abused as a child. People respond and react differently. There are individuals who are abused. They are very shy, very reserved. There are others that talk too much. It's very hard to pinpoint because some people are very good at hiding what they have been through. Other times, they are more open about it with their body language, with their behavior. But it is very difficult to really put your finger and say, this person has been. Just because somebody has insomnia doesn't mean they're abused. Just because they're promiscuous doesn't mean they're abused. Now, with prostitutes, I've heard in the United States, over 90, that's 9-0, over 90% of prostitutes were sexually abused in their childhood. Now, when I heard that, I believe that prostitution chose them and not the other way around. That is an identifier. Not every individual who's a prostitute was abused, but often that is the case. If you have a young girl who's promiscuous, you have to consider where is that behavior coming out from. It's important to ask yourself questions rather than judging and pointing the finger because often when a person behaves a certain way, it's simply a cry for help. They are trying to communicate something to you they don't know how to or they believe that love comes to them through their body, through various means. And so we've got to try to understand that. Now, with those indicators, I know there's boys, there's girls who are children mm -hmm. who might be abused. How do you really communicate with persons of that tender age? For example, persons under 13, mm -hmm. who we consider here to be children. How do you actually communicate with a person of that age, the younger ones, as opposed to the older ones? And um, also, the boys and the girls. I would say that it's important to be transparent and to have conversations with them. What I would say from my personal experience is that it's not an age thing. When I talk to children under 18, I find that they give me better definitions of a pimp than most adults. And so I would say that irrespective of the age, children are actually a lot more clued up than we realize. One child in a class that I was asking a question of who is a pimp, she was 10 years of age and her definition is better than what I usually get. So I spoke quite recently, and the definitions I was receiving from adults is that a pimp is a man who sells women, which is wrong. Now the child who was 10, and I asked her age because I was amazed at her definition, her definition was, and I quote, somebody who helps you sell your body. Perfect definition. I've had children very, very young watch some of the videos that I show, and when they watch the videos, they're able to dissect and explain to me what is going on, whereas I show it to parents and caregivers, and they are clueless. Therefore, I don't feel we need to dumb down the way we communicate to them, but I feel we've got to use appropriate language. Now, there's a girl in the U.S. She was seven years of age. She came to school, and she said, Daddy's eating my cookie. Now, that was her private parts. Therefore, it's really important for parents to know how to communicate to their children so that if abuse is happening and is disclosed, whoever hears the disclosure understands what it means because quite often the disclosure comes out at school to the child's friends. Using the term cookie, pumpkin, butterfly, banana or cherry is inappropriate. Just call it private parts. When I was growing up as a child, my mother used the correct term. When I was very small, I was under four, she said nobody should touch your private parts. You have to have these conversations. Now, I'm an only child and I have siblings by my father's side and I've had conversations with them. I believe in transparency and openness. What often happens, especially in Christian circles, is that people are afraid to talk about things, but the reality is that children are doing it anyway. And with the internet and technology, they're able to fall upon or uncover things that they really shouldn't. Therefore, it's a lot better that you preempt the information that they will find and have those conversations, but use language that they understand. If it comes to pornography, there are ways to explain that. Good pictures and bad pictures. Good touch and bad touch. So I feel that you have to understand what level is that child at. And even so, what are they exposed to? 
Nowadays, we have videos, we have games, cartoons and animations exposing children to sexualized things. And so when we understand and accept that, we've got to realize that they are being indoctrinated by the media, but the education needs to start in the home. That way, if the child sees something, they've already been prepared beforehand. Now, we've seen on the internet quite recently these new dolls called LOL dolls. I saw a video in one of my Facebook groups, and the doll has a button on its private parts. But if you've already had a conversation with your child about their private parts, then when that LOL doll comes into their possession, they would know that even if there's a button, they should not be touching the doll's private parts. So it's about having these conversations so that they're not being educated by the LOL dolls. So that's important. Now, is it easy to communicate with boys who are sexual abusers to children and girls? Is the boys that food coming in terms of explaining exactly what happens to them? Do you mean the boys disclosing? Disclosing. Or? I would say from what I've heard that it's very difficult for boys to disclose. I believe it's because quite often, but not always, quite often the abuse is by another male. Or because boys are meant to be macho, if they are abused by a female, then it shows a sign of weakness, supposedly. Often when a boy is abused and if he's homosexual, it's even harder for him to come out about that. And then there are boys who are abused and then end up having questions about sexuality and believe that they're homosexual or transgender. So it is very difficult and it's a very sensitive topic. I would say because society believes that women and girls are, are weaker or vulnerable, then it is easier for women to disclose. Now I'm not saying we disclose straight away, but because it's the norm to hear of cases of women being abused, then therefore it's a little more easier to disclose. But there are people who don't really believe boys can be victims, which would make it harder for a boy to speak about. Even when I was sharing quite recently on a platform in St. Vincent, I was sharing about abuse, and one of the callers rang in and said boys get abused too. And they told me that as though they were informing me, and I felt almost insulted because I do know that. And although I speak mainly on girls, it's because my topic is primarily on sex trafficking and the vulnerabilities, but I do give stories and give reference to boys being abused. However, the challenge is a lot of boys do not report it. They feel ashamed and embarrassed, and so all of this makes it very, very hard. But I feel when we ask questions, it's important to listen not just with our ears, but with our eyes. When you ask a question to somebody, you have to accept and appreciate. They may say no with their mouth, but their body language is saying otherwise. And so that is the key. That is what is really important. And more conversation needs to happen around boys being abused. But the challenge is the information is not really out there. Now, there is a documentary that has been made by a couple in the United States called Boys, Boys Documentary. And there's even a gentleman in the UK who was a victim of abuse. And he had a documentary stroke movie that came out very recently. And he has a book. So the conversation is happening, but it's still not enough. But what I will say is the message that I share and the way in which I share it, I have boys and men around the world tell me their stories of being abused, often for the first time. Why do they tell me? I don't have the answers to that, but they feel comfortable enough to do so. One thing I'll say is most likely they do not feel judged. They feel that by sharing with me, the information will stay there. I will not speak ill of them or think differently. I will see them as a human being. And I believe that my Christian faith is one of the reasons why, as best as I can, I try not to judge because I don't know a person's story. But I will say that for the rest of society, often we don't want to talk about it, we can't comprehend it, and that makes it hard for a boy to come out and say something when it's so much kept under wraps and kept very, very quiet. We're going to take our first uh, commercial break and we'll be right back with uh, Miss Juanita Headley. Paying is faster and easier with Blow Fast Pay. Use your MasterCard or Visa and pay from anywhere. Log on to discoverflow.co slash fastpay and press consumer. Select your country and enter your account number. Enter the amount to be paid and an email address. Enter your credit card information. You'll receive a payment confirmation with the transaction details. Along with a receipt to your email address. It's fast, safe, and easy. Blow. Keeping you connected.
can call her home Her innocence was stolen Her shattered heart is broken Quietly suffering she I'm
Yes, and uh, good night to our viewers once again. We are back on Care Self Protect. It's a live stream program coming to you on the auspices of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force Public Relations and Complaints Department. And on tonight's program, we have Miss Juanita Headley. And uh, Miss Headley, we just saw a video that was played. And can you explain exactly what the video is all about? With regards to the video, Believe in Me, it was formed from Courage Worldwide. They have a house called Courage House, and in fact, that is where they have young girls under 18 who survive sex trafficking. Now, this is set up in California. It's a Christian organization, and this video actually comes out of the work that they do, protecting and safeguarding young girls who have been exploited. This video is something I show quite often when I'm doing presentations. Why is that? To get people to understand the journey that sometimes a victim or survivor of trafficking may find themselves in. With this particular video, the young girl is a victim of domestic violence at the hands of her father. As a result of that domestic violence, she runs away from home. What people often don't understand is usually within the first 12 to 24 hours, when a girl or boy runs away from home, that is when they are rescued often from one bad situation into something a lot worse. If a child wants to run away from home or says that they intend to run away from home, instead of discouraging them from doing that, the better response is to ask them why. Because if they're running away from one thing, there is clearly a reason for why they're running into something which is very much unknown. And the sad reality is a lot of victims who run away from home they believe that this person who comes up to them is out to help them, as we saw in the video, when in fact that is often not the case. In fact, quite recently I was working with some victims of trafficking. They had not run away from home, but they had moved from one country to another. They needed help and assistance. Somebody offered them that help and sold them into sexual exploitation. In this video, the young girl, she's a teenager as we can see, she ends up being rescued by a guy, moved into a house which could be deemed a brothel per se, and these young girls are all sold for sex. And we see the young girl lying on a bed crying. The man who purchases her is married, because quite often these men who purchase young girls and women are sometimes married in relationships or even have children of their own. When I watched this video and another video of Call Me Family around five years ago, I cried the entire time because I understood exactly what I was seeing. Now when I show these videos, it's not to get people emotional, it's to get them to understand the reality of how prostitution, human trafficking may sometimes exist and may sometimes begin because that individual on the street corner in a hotel or a brothel was taken advantage of in the past, abused previously, or was a victim of some form of abuse at home and has tried to leave that and walk into a better life when in fact, as with this young girl, they walk into a situation that is a lot more destructive. Now, I know your specialty really is a child sex abuse and also child trafficking, mm -hmm. human trafficking per se. What exactly is human trafficking? The legal definition is often misunderstood by most people. So I do not use the legal definition. The way I simplistically explain it is that human trafficking is the exploitation of one individual by another. Now we sometimes have watched movies or read books about trafficking and when you see something like Taken, your perception and understanding is that human trafficking requires kidnapping or movements. Now this is not the case. Now I explain as simplistically as this. In my opinion, when you have men and women in sex, you have sex trafficking. In my opinion, when you have restaurants, businesses and establishments, you have labor trafficking. In my opinion, when you have sick people, people with ailments, you have organ trafficking. Quite simply, it is a person or persons taking advantage of another. So for example, since we're here in St. Vincent, you could be born in Kingstown, live in Kingstown and be trafficked in Kingstown. If your mother or your father was your pimp, you would not have to leave your own bedroom. And so my desire is to get people to understand about domestic trafficking. Domestic trafficking is when you're exploited in your home country. Nobody needs to take away your passport or your identification. And realistically speaking, if you are, let's say, black or brown skinned, or of African or Caribbean descent, 
it would be a lot easier to traffic you in the Caribbean or Africa or in a country with people who look ethnically like you rather than in China. It would make sense for a pimp or trafficker to traffic a Chinese person in China than someone who looks like me because I stand out like a sore thumb. And that is quite scary because if you think about it, domestic trafficking would be happening right in front of you but you would have no idea. Like I said earlier of the little girl whose father used to take her to the amusement park, she'd go in the restroom and a guy would come in there, take her by the hand and have sex with her and engage in sexual activity. If anybody saw that white man with a little girl eating an ice cream or candy floss, they would not know a transaction took place and the girl was being sold. And that is very frightening, but the reality is that trafficking can very much look like that. In Trinidad and Tobago, where I spend a lot of time, I've read articles of young girls being sold for sex by their parents, and I've heard comments that there are men who actually say that their child is now ready for them to have sex with because she is a certain age. That may be cultural, but it is abuse, it is pedophilia, and it is not acceptable under any circumstances. So we have to understand that people have different beliefs, but the law is a law, and when a crime has been committed, that person deserves to be prosecuted, so that is important. But we have to understand that often exploitation is hidden in plain sight, and we as people look at movies to understand what these things are, and often we are mistaken. Smuggling is often when a person wants to go to another country for a better life, they pay money to go there. Trafficking is when you are promised a better life, however, then when you arrive, you get sent to a brothel, or you get sent to a brick kiln, a factory, or other places of employment, such as domestic servitude, as a maid, an au pair, and that was not what you signed up for. Smuggling is when you have agreed to go there, and you have agreed to the terms and conditions. Trafficking is when those terms and conditions that you originally agreed to are changed, or there is deception. You were told from the get-go, you're going to go over as a nanny, you get there as a brothel. So that is something that is important. Now, in respect of domestic trafficking, and something I really want to understand. Now, you said it can be done in your own home, mm -hmm. right? Now, for example, a, a parent and uh, selling a, a child for sex. Money is passed. Can that be considered also as possible? Because the child is a minor, we cannot have child prostitutes. And that is really important because people say child prostitutes, a child cannot consent to sex. There is no such thing as child prostitution. And with the offense of human trafficking, it requires three elements, acts, A-C-T-S, means and purpose. When it's a child, only two of those elements are required. The legal definition, as the Palermo Protocol says, it is the recruitment, transportation, harboring, enticing of an individual with the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of modern day slavery, sex trafficking, organ trafficking, trafficking, domestic servitude. When it is a minor, there is no requirement for force, fraud, or coercion. In other words, the child does not need to be forced. The child could, if we can use this term, willingly be prostituted, which isn't possible, but the law removes that element. Therefore, when it is a child, it may be the offense of sexual abuse, sexual assault, rape, or trafficking. But a child, it would not be prostitution because they're a minor. So it's important to point that out. With adults, prostitution and trafficking are very different. Prostitution, in the eyes of the law, LAW, prostitution is consensual. I find it difficult to say consensual because I spend time with prostitutes and often they're in that industry because of being abused, being exploited, or because they believe that is all that they can do, sell their body, to pay their bills, to feed their children. So I don't believe choice is involved. So it makes me very uncomfortable saying that. But with a minor, a minor can never be a prostitute. There is no such thing as a child prostitute. And that is a very insulting and offensive thing to say. So we have to understand with a child, the offense could be sexual assault, rape, sexual abuse. It could be molestation, for example, or trafficking. Prostitution doesn't come into it. So I want to point that out. Because if I'm being abused by my uncle, let's say my uncle's abusing me, it may simply be sexual abuse, not trafficking. So that's important to point out. Now, what makes 
makes a, a person becomes a trafficker? For example, children. What do you think will make a person want to traffic a child for sexual purposes? In a place like the Philippines, where it's number one for cyber sex trafficking, there are many reasons. I'd say the primary one is because many of the people in the Philippines, but not all, are coming out of poverty. I've been to the Philippines many a time, and I absolutely love it, but it is a place with a lot of poverty. Now, if somebody offers, for example, to teach your children English by a webcam, you may naively agree to that without realizing it's not English they're being taught, it's a sexual activity. On the other hand, that pedophile may actually be very transparent and say to you, I want to have sex with your children. At times, the pedophile engages the parents in the sexual activity by getting the parents to abuse their children. Now, why do the parents do that? I believe the motivation is the money because they're being paid to do it. There are some individuals, however, who will traffic a child and they do not benefit financially. In fact, I know the story of a young boy. Now, he, he was adopted. He was from Russia, if I have that correct. And he had two dads. They were married, according to the law, LAW. And these two dads were German and Chinese Australian. They adopted him when he was around six months old. And then they bought him, they physically bought him with money. They paid for him, so it was an illegal adoption. And then they bought him to Australia. And then what they did with their son, they would have him walk around the house with no shirt on, just with pants or, or jeans, pants, shorts. And they would film him at all times. So from birth, he became very comfortable in front of the camera. He was always being filmed. These men were pedophiles and sexually abused their son until he was rescued at four years of age. He went through very, very disturbing things. They did not benefit financially. They were trafficking their son. However, they were not being paid to do so. Now, we don't understand what was their motivation. Number one, they went to Russia. They purchased a boy. And then they took him around the world. He had two passports by the time he was like four. His passports for so many stamps because they would exchange him. And I don't know why they did that. I don't have the answers, but it was not a money motivation. But quite often when people are selling their children, it's because they want money. Now, not always because they're impoverished. Sometimes it's because they want to have a better lifestyle, a better standard of living. When we have pimps in the U.S., the ones that we all think about with the white coat or the red coat or the big shoes, the gold chains, that is because he wants to feed a very extravagant lifestyle. So there are those people who traffic their children, not because they're in poverty, but they want to have the Gucci, the Parada, the Louis Vuitton. And then there are those in the Philippines who have nothing and they have a child. And so they see, well, my child is ripe for the pickings. We have the Internet. And in the Philippines, they have free Facebook. That means you don't even need Internet to use Facebook. How does that work? I don't have answers. But in the Philippines, we have free Facebook, which makes it easier to sell our children on the Internet. Now, you say you've been to about 30 of countries around the world. How many countries in the Caribbean have you walked in? Thus far, I've been to Trinidad and, to Trinidad and Tobago and St. Vincent for speaking purposes. I've been to Jamaica and Barbados for vacation only. My family are originally from Jamaica, and as a vegan, I do not eat animals, only plants. As a vegan, I guess you could say I eat ital food. I would much rather be in a place where my diet can be accommodated. I have allergies, and I want to save the animals. My desire is to take the message a lot further than just St. Vincent, Trinidad, and Tobago. As I shared earlier, I wish I could stay longer, but of course that costs a flight ticket, and I work pro bono. But, of course, if God is in it, then that will happen. If he wants me to return on the 10th, I will do so. But for me, this message needs to get further afield. And I'm honored to be here because I spent a lot of time in Asia. I love Asia, but I am of Caribbean descent. And so for me, it makes more sense to be in a place where I can fit in a little bit more and where I look like the people and can understand the culture a bit more because I grew up with Caribbean parents. And I feel that I'm at more of an advantage in a place where the people will look at me and will hear what I've got to say and maybe take it a little bit more seriously because I'm not so much of an outsider. In Asia, when I bring my message, they're often starstruck. And they may listen, but may not fully take it on, because who am I? However, I believe it's important to embrace the culture. So whenever I go somewhere, 
as best as I can, I try to embrace the culture of the community. I give an example. So I read a story of a man in Yemen. Now this man, on his wedding night, his wife died. Now having been to India multiple times, for me, India is the best country in the world. A lot of people would disagree, but for me, from my background and my experiences, best country in the world. When I go to India, I sleep on the floor, I eat with my right hand, I do all that they do, dress like them, eat like them. Everything apart from my compromising my faith in Jesus Christ. So if I was in Yemen, I would eat like them, dress like them, and behave like them without compromising my faith in Jesus. And then I would say, for example, Mr. Yemen, marriage is good. Marriage is a beautiful thing. But your wife was six. He was 40. Now, when people are shocked by that, I don't understand because in my country and in your country, there are men of 40 having sex with six-year-olds all the time and it is not their wife. Now, I do not agree with child marriage. I'm just making a point. That is their culture. If I want to see an end to child marriage, I have to find a way to meet them where they're at. If I come all guns blurring to my opinion, it will not work. And the reason I can move amongst these 38 countries is because like in the Bible, when I'm in Rome, I become like a Roman. So when I'm in India, I sleep on the floor, I eat with my hand. It took a while to get there. Now I can't stop eating with hands. The point is you've got to learn to adjust. People are more willing to receive the information you have if you look more like them. So being in the Caribbean is a greater advantage because I am Caribbean, British born. When I'm in Asia, although I do not look like them, as best as I can, I embrace and immerse that culture so that when I come with my advice and guidance, they're willing to take a little bit of what I've got to say and implement it into their lives. And it comes now to my next question in respect of culture, different cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, you are speaking about child abuse, but you are in, especially in the Middle East, Asia, where there are young girls very young, who are actual wives of men who are triple times their age. How do you deal with that? For me, it's very disturbing and it's difficult because I want to respect a person's culture, but I also want to educate them. When I hear stories of girls in India who die on their wedding night from internal bleeding, that just messes with my head. I saw a picture when I was in Bangalore in the south of India of a young girl and the young girl was standing on a chair so she could hold her husband's hand. And even when you think about it, I mean, obviously you can't see the picture, but the child was so small she had to stand on a chair. And it is difficult because that is all that they know. And I think sometimes because that mother who gives the daughter over to the husband, she too may have been a victim of child marriage. It is very, very hard, and I think we have to understand that with all things it takes time. And I believe that we have to try to understand them, not force them to change, but understand them. In other words, listen to them, ask them, what are the benefits of marrying off your six-year-old? What are the be In other words, to me, if I want somebody to change something they're doing, instead of me forcing them, I will ask questions. So if we move from child marriage to, for example, domestic violence or trafficking, and a woman is in a relationship or a girl with a person who is abusive towards them, rather than me forcing her to leave, I would ask her questions. So you told me he loves you, but how does he demonstrate that? And you said he hit you yesterday. Does that, does that feel loving to you? I feel questions are the best way. So let's say that the mother has sought her six-year-old to be married, and she too was a victim of child marriage. I would ask her, were you happy when you were being married? What was it like for you? And if she's transparent and honest, I'm sure she'll tell you, well, actually, I didn't want to get married. And I say that because I have friends in India who study and study and study because the more they study, the later it is to get married. And they're all over 18, but there is that pressure. It is very hard, and many of my friends are strong Christians, but they believe in arranged marriage. They say, well, my parents are going to be able to make a good choice. There was arranged marriage in the Bible. Or some of them say, well, if my husband is happy, I am happy. It is very difficult to get people to change the way that they think. And instead of coming with your ideas and opinions and trying to force them to think like you, I think it's a lot better to listen to them. And when you listen, it's not that you're looking for, for sort of flaws in what they have to say, but when you listen, you're able to, to dissect what they're saying and bring the conversation around to a new way of doing things. Because it is really, really hard, and we've got to think 
that even though they call this marriage, in the eyes of the law in the West, that is pedophilia. And it is sad that in these countries they are legalizing pedophilia by saying a man can marry a child. The question that I have in my head though is why does a 40 year old man want a six year old wife? Now please hear me carefully, right? Please hear me carefully. I'm not a feminist or women's room or women's job is in the kitchen, not at all. But a six year old cannot cook, cannot clean, cannot hold an intellectual conversation. Hear that loosely. So what is a 40 year old man doing with a six year old? I'm not saying all men want someone who cooks and cleans, but I'm just saying that there are certain so-called wifely duties. I don't agree with that. I believe in equality. But I'm just trying to make a point. A six-year-old cannot do her wifely duties. And there is a high chance she will die having sex on her wedding night. Why would you do that? I mean, I would ask these men, but when you consummate, which means have sex, when you have sex on your wedding night, on your honeymoon, your wife could die. Why don't you wait until she's 12? Well, of course not. I'm just making a point, right? Wait until she's of legal age, until there's less chance of your wife dying. I mean, for me, I would try to get them to think about the number of deaths of six-year-olds. So I would say to these Yemen men, isn't there a bit of a pattern with, with wives dying? And they'd say, yes, you're right, Juanita, you're right. And I'd say, why do you think that is? And they may, say, they may say, we don't know. And then I would say, well, what about if your wife was seven? Well, not really, but you know, I would just try to get them to, to understand when you marry a six-year-old, there is a high chance she will die. And I'm sure you married her, you know, till sickness and, and it, through sickness and health until death do us part. But you really wanted to die on your wedding night. So I would try to find a way to get them to move away from six-year-olds and then seven-year-olds until we get to an age where there's a lower chance of her dying from internal bleeding or broken pelvis. Now, Middle East compared to the Caribbean, how do you see the difference in respect of child abuse, child sexual abuse? I would say culturally in places like the Middle East we hear about girls being abused or raped and virginity is a huge thing out there and we hear about them sometimes having to marry their rapist we hear about honor killings where the young girl or woman is, is kicked out of the family and things in the Caribbean culture each country is different in Trinidad there are problems in, in St. Vincent there are problems every country has their issues what I would say across the board in the Caribbean, what I believe is going on is that children who are being abused, when they do disclose, number one, it's not believed. But in addition to that, when that child is being abused and it comes out, if the father or boyfriend or stepdad is the breadwinner, then sadly, he often stays in the picture. And that is where things need to change. And then also you've got to think that sadly, a lot of parents do not get, parents meaning mother, do not get rid of the boyfriend, partner, husband because they feel embarrassed, the shame, the stigma. So sadly, they put their needs and not even sexual needs, their needs above that of the child. What are you saying to the child when you do not kick out the person? I don't mean physically kick them or anything. I mean, get rid of them. Leave, let them leave the house instead of having them stay there. When that person continues to live with a wife, girlfriend, or partner, he gets to have sex with the wife, girlfriend, or partner, and the child. What exactly are you teaching the child? Now, I had a client once, and she said to me that even though things were not perfect, her mom and dad stayed together, which I thought was great. But as we spoke more, I realized there was domestic violence. What are you teaching your children when you make it seem as though it's okay for them to be sexually abused and for the guy to stay around? I heard of a case in St. Vincent. A young girl was being sexually abused at home by her father. And then on one occasion, the brother stumbled upon the sexual activity and the dad asked him to join in. That is very sick. And I've heard of cases of children who are being abused often in the church, in the Caribbean community, in the church, by the pastor, by the elder. I know of an individual who gave me permission to share her story, and I thought the story needs to be shared. She shared with me that when she was a child, she was a victim of sexual abuse. However, the journey did not start there. Many, many decades before that, a girl of 14 became pregnant and gave birth to a son. This lady, the 14-year-old mother, she eventually sexually abused her biological son. That son, outside of marriage, had a child, and he sexually abused that child, which is the person that I know. Now that girl, her mother abandoned her. 
maybe she was around 11 or 12, and she stayed with the father. And she was excited to be with her dad, to be reconciled and reunited, until the dad sexually abused her. Then it gets worse. Her grandmother, which is the 14-year-old who got pregnant, the grandmother would get a lamp and would sexually abuse the child, sexually abuse her under the guise of inspections. The grandmother was inspecting the child's private parts before selling her for sex, which was trafficking, which was trafficking. Now, this lady who I know, she did not know she had been trafficked, but the grandmother who had been touching her private parts with a lamp under the guise of inspection had been sending the granddaughter off to a man and money was exchanged for sex. But it gets a little bit worse because this girl, who's now a Christian, now a woman, now a believer of Jesus Christ, she hated God and wanted to kill her biological father, who was a person of the church. She tore up the Bible and put the Bible in her underwear to protect her. The Bible was removed by her aunt and uncle, who also sexually abused her. Now, she's not originally from St. Vincent. She's from the Caribbean. And I'm sure she is not the first person to go through something like this and will not be the last. When you hear things like that, it is very disturbing. The grandmother, the father, the aunt, the uncle. For those who believe in generational curses, that's how it sounds. She's now a believer and she's forgiven those who perpetrated that against her. But the fact of the matter is that nobody did anything to protect her. The people who should be caring for her and protecting her were abusing and violating her. And I hear stories continuously. I heard a story recently of a young child, a boy in fact, their female family member would show them pornography so that that child under five would know what sexual activity to perform upon her. Things like this are very messed up. And we have to understand that some of these pedophiles, because that's what they are, are right in the church. And so the community is very different because in a Caribbean culture, especially a place like St. Vincent, there are people who, according to the Bible, are living in sin. That means that they are living outside of marriage. And so there's no big thing about virginity. But in Middle Eastern and Muslim countries, virginity is a big thing. And if you are raped, you get kicked out of the family, whatever, whatever, etc. The repercussions are serious. But in a culture like the Caribbean, where people sleep around and are promiscuous and live in partner, virginity is no big deal. And so things are different here, where if you're abused, you may be considered discarded goods, but nobody's going to kick you out or murder you or any of that stuff. Both is just as bad. Children should be protected, not murdered, let alone be told to marry their perpetrator or abuser to keep the family's honor, which is something that happens in the Middle East. To keep the family's name, you must marry a rapist. That's not okay. Now we're going to take another break and we'll be right back with Miss Juanita Headley. Reading sets the foundation. Set the foundation now. The best bedtime storybooks are at Jack's. Something I have longed for, for as long as I can remember. This is my story.
Cause I'm still alive Under this same sky Wishing on that same star For strength to survive But who The tears from my face Cause I won't leave another in this place oh. I look up to the sky And through my red swollen eyes I see my And we are back. Um, 
It's the KSO Protect live stream program on Facebook. Royal St. Vincent and Grindings Police Force, the Public Relations and Complaints Department. And we are coming to you here this Tuesday night, our special edition of the program. We have in the studio Miss Juanita Headley. She's an international public speaker, an author, and also an attorney at law. And we are speaking child abuse, child sex abuse especially, and uh, human trafficking dealing with uh, children. Now, that video that we just saw is called the Kobe Family. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that video all about? The video right at the beginning depicts a lady who is a prostitute. Now, I don't feel comfortable using the term prostitute. I prefer prostituted because something is being done to her. Often when we think of prostitution, we think of women who may be promiscuous or enjoy sex. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that these women are victims under every circumstance. That's my opinion. Now, when we see this woman in the video, she has on a short skirt and fishnet tight. So we know exactly the nature of the so-called work that she does. Now, I do not believe prostitution is a job whatsoever. I believe that it is someone being taken advantage of. I believe it is more simply paid rape. Now, the lady is standing on the street corner waiting for so-called customers, and she has a daughter. The daughter goes off with a guy. Now, it's interesting, whenever I show this movie around the world to anybody over the age of 18, they believe that the guy right at the beginning of that video was the girl's father or grandfather. Now, when I hear that, it really saddens me. When I watched this five years ago in California, I cried hysterically the whole time. Now, I'm not an emotional person, but I understood exactly what was going on. Never seeing this before, I knew immediately the child was being sold for sex. Now, when I show the video, my audiences educate me about it, and somebody made the observation that the little girl was looking behind her because she had no idea who she was going with or when she was returning. Now, there are some people who say things like, well, she wasn't screaming or bawling, so she wasn't going with a stranger. And that, for me, I think is nonsense. And I say that because when a child has been groomed, when a child has been programmed, if I can use that term, they will not cry or bawl or scream if it has been normalized. Now, let's imagine this has happened multiple times, that when her mother stands on the street corner, the girl goes with a man for sex, a different man. We have to understand that this sort of thing happens right in front of us. And as I said earlier, that is the scary thing about it. Now, when the girl is on the merry-go-round at eight years of age, she's with a lady. Now, that lady is not her mother. And I say that because if it was her mother, she'd be wearing the same outfit, the so-called prostitute outfit. Instead, I believe that lady is her pimp. And she's doing the child's hair because she's grooming her. The man on the merry-go-round, there are adults that watch this video for the first time and they believe the man on the merry-go-round is the child's father. But for those of you who paid attention, he was rubbing his legs sexually. And some people say that, I wonder what kind of father did you have? Because his behavior and the way he was looking at the child was clearly sexualized. Then when she was 16, instead of going to prom, she's having sex with the same guy. Then at 26, she gets a phone call and there's a flashback. The lady from the merry-go-round has called her. When the vehicle pulls up, she gets into the vehicle after having looked through the window. Even the way that she bent down was very sexualized. I mean, think about it. When you get into a vehicle, do you need to look into the window? Usually you recognize the license plate or the vehicle car. When I get into the vehicle of somebody I know, I don't have to talk to them through the window. But she was discussing the transaction that would take place. And the reason I show this video is because I want people to understand that with human trafficking, child sexual abuse, it is a journey that started somewhere. When a woman is prostituting herself, it may have started when she was trafficked by her mother when she was around four. When a person becomes a trafficking victim, it may have started as a result of being sexually abused, domestic violence, running away from home, or vulnerabilities. So my desire is for people to be educated, to know that whenever we see an individual leading a destructive or harmful lifestyle, it didn't start when they were 26, it started many, many years, years earlier, and sometimes as a result of what was done to them without their free will. I think it's a really important video to show, because the sad reality is 
right now somewhere in the world a man a woman a boy a girl is being sexually abused tortured raped and murdered right now right now and that was why i cried because that is a reality even right now in this country somebody is having an argument somebody's having a glass of water somebody's having sex and maybe with a child somebody is maybe having a physical fight at the end of the day when we look at it like that we realize it is not just a video it is not a music video it depicts reality now it's very hard sometimes to really comprehend what can be bring to the mind of an adult to have sex with a child and not even a child a child that young no i don't know you would have um, spoken to children i know over the years along with the child abuse what about the person who would have perpetrated those offenses have you ever had conversation with those persons trying to understand why did you do that well actually quite recently i was on an interview via zoom in ghana and i've been to ghana and i was reading an article on facebook and this article is called sex is for my people now as a strong christian i completely agree with that and therefore i read the article and i reached out to the individual who was the host of the program as well as the musician long story short i read the article on monday by friday i was being interviewed on the topic of abuse and human trafficking it was an instagram interview and for me personally i felt like it was my first christian interview i was able to just say absolutely everything i wanted to about christianity in relation to the topic of sex and abuse and my host was phenomenal during that program we had people ring in or or write in i guess i should say and ask advice on various things one individual was very brave it was a man who wrote in and said i have been sexually abused as a child i am in ghana and as a result of what i have been through i am now married and have a child of my own but i pay for boys to have sex with them and i really respected him for sharing that because how many people are going to write in social media live where your name publicly comes up and actually be so transparent and i told him i respect him for sharing but i told him in the eyes of the law law i said you are a pedophile now as i said earlier in the program that i desire to build safe houses for victims of human trafficking and i desire to build bakeries to hire former homeless people former prostitutes and ex convicts i want to hire pedophiles now a lot of people do not want to hear that but i'm going to say it as it is people who know me know i am frank and direct the god that i served was also frank and direct i believe in john 316 i believe in second chances not castration not the death penalty but i believe in prison and i shared that recently on a program and the person rang in and said i disagree they go to prison come out worse i didn't say prison and release i said prison i believe in safeguarding and protecting children that's what i believe and because i believe in the god of jesus christ meaning the the father of jesus christ i believe in god i believe in giving people the opportunity to find christ but i'm not naive to say let them be released to go and commit harm to other people now this individual according to the law is a pedophile that is the law any person who has sex with children is a pedophile however i believe it is important for us to change our language the god that i serve in jesus christ i believe he sees us as human beings for example human beings with a tendency to commit murder human beings with a tendency to steal or human beings with a, a tendency to have sex with children what we have to understand is that pedophiles are people so although i use the term pedophiles i believe they're human beings number 1 human beings because when you label somebody a pedophile in my opinion according to the bible there's life and death in the tongue our words have power so when you call somebody a pedophile that's all they can be a pedophile but if you say human being with the tendency to that means there's a possibility they can change when we start labeling people and judging people we're not allowing ourselves to consider that that person can change within the confines of a prison of course So when I spoke to this guy I told him what you were doing is a crime it is illegal it is immoral he explained he'd been a victim of abuse 
Now I said to him, what I recommend you do is to delete the phone numbers of the boys you have sex with. Do not go around those areas where you know that they are. If you are an alcoholic, you need to avoid the bars, the liquor shops, you need to avoid parties, you have to help yourself. This guy was a Christian, allegedly. Allegedly, because Christians are not pedophiles, right? Well, number one, we're human beings first. At the end of the day, people are people. They make mistakes. They do things they shouldn't. We all screw up, okay? Therefore, for me personally, if a person is a pedophile, I believe, number one, they need to be wise about the places they go, the things that they do, etc. But we as people need to stop judging them, and we need to get to the root cause, what is causing them to behave that way? Think about the story I shared earlier. A father is having sex with his daughter. The son discovers them. The dad tells him to join in. Now, if we think about it, that son technically is not a pedophile. His father enticed him to do so. Now, of course, the son is culpable for the crime he committed, but you've got to understand that was not his idea. I am not justifying, but I have a different way of looking at criminals than your average human being because my desire is to look at them through God's eyes. What about somebody like Peter Scully? Peter Scully left Australia in 2011. He stole millions of dollars in business investments, leaving his wife and two children, and came to the Philippines and set up the No Limits Fund Company. Now, Peter Scully committed the most heinous sexual offenses the Philippines has ever seen. The police and social workers cried when they watched Daisy's Destruction. Now, Daisy's Destruction is a video with Peter Scully and his Filipino girlfriend, Lizel. They sexually abused and tortured Daisy. And then what they did, they hung her upside down and dripped candle wax on her genitals. They then beat her and tortured her to the point of death. Daisy was 18 months old. Now, actually, the reality is Daisy didn't die, but everybody who saw that believed she was dead. So what exactly did she go through? She's now around five or six, living in a Filipino safe house. By the grace of God, she's receiving therapy and counseling, but still suffering from the trauma that she went through. Now, Scully was in prison, and the good news is he did get life imprisonment last August, and his Filipino girlfriend, Liza, was arrested. She was a sex tour guide, Walking down the beach of Malacasqua Island, where I was in the summer, she was arrested and she's now incarcerated. Now, Lizo, she was prostituted as a child. She was not a prostitute. She was victimized as a child and sold into prostitution. Now, she meets Peter Scully, this Australian who's making 10,000 US dollars per view on Daisy's destruction, still earning that income in prison, getting special privileges, air conditioning, the women from the jail next door performing sexual activities on him and with him in his jail. Lizo engaged in sexual activity with children. Why? Because she was a victim herself. Why did Scully do that? We do not know. Now, we cannot always say it's because these men were victims, because these women were victims. Sometimes it has nothing to do with being abused as a child. Sometimes it's because of pornography. I was watching a documentary called Operation Tucson by OUR, Operation Underground Railroad. Fantastic documentary, quite traumatizing, but very informative. And one of the people who shared on there was the founder, Tim Ballard, and he actually said that some of these pedophiles, because the US, according to him, are the main distributors and producers and viewers of child pornography. He explained often it starts with accessing a magazine, a Playboy magazine in childhood. Then of course we have the internet. So they start watching pornography with a man and a woman. And then with multiple humans. And then with animals. And then child pornography. But that isn't enough. So after the child pornography, they have to go and enact what they've seen. So some of these men are victims. Some of these men, it's because they need a greater high. It started with an accidental viewing of a magazine and then pornography is not harmless. We don't understand the impact of it, but it messes with the brain. And for men who watch pornography and engage in sexual activity with themselves or with their hand, one day when they get married, they will need Viagra to have sex with their wife. Because as watching, watching the pornography, as a result of watching the pornography, they're unable to perform their marital duties. 
So if you know any boys and men watching porn, tell them to start saving because Viagra is not cheap. <laughs> I just had to say that. Is, is that an endorsement? Uh, <laughs> no, um, you said um, despite of all that, you still want to help persons who were perpetrators of some of those crimes. You want to open a party, a big party. I believe that with baking and with, with food, it can often be very healing. In fact, I've heard of survivors and victims of trafficking who bake with their hands. When you use your hands to create or build something, it is an amazing thing because you've got a few ingredients and you're able to create and produce something that is beautiful. In fact, I've had experience working with juvenile delinquents in the Philippines teaching them baking. What was amazing about working with these young boys is that they were able to create some beautiful cakes and desserts. Now, usually all they do is sleep, and the sad reality is aside from sleeping, smoking, and drinking alcohol, which they're not allowed to do, they would sometimes rape one of the homosexual boys that was in the orphanage and in the safe house. Because we had an orphanage, a safe house, and the juvenile delinquents, sometimes an individual, not in this case, may not indeed be a criminal, but be in a juvenile delinquent facility because there's nowhere else to place them. With this one in particular, though, it was all juvenile delinquents. One of them was homosexual. So aside from the drinking, smoking, and sleeping, they would actually rape him. Now, when I went there, I was able to engage with the young boys and provide activities for them. And I was really amazed and impressed because even though they'd never baked before, some of them had natural talents and natural giftings. And I would always ask their opinion. When we were baking a cake, and if it didn't bake in the time it was supposed to, I would ask them, how much longer? What do you think? And it would be a team effort. What is amazing is think about it. You just have flour, eggs, milk, butter, and you look at those ingredients on a table. And then when you create a cake at the end, that is an amazing thing because you know what? Despite what you've been through, despite those physical, emotional scars, you can create and produce something beautiful. I love to bake. I'm a huge fan of baking. I want to have a vegan bakery. And in the United States, there is a bakery called Greystone. Greystone has been around for three decades or more. The founder passed away last year, November, I believe. And Greystone Bakery is where I got the idea of having an open hiring policy bakery. I am a vegan, as I've said, and when I would shop in Whole Foods, aka Whole Paycheck, because it's so expensive, I would sometimes see brownies. These brownies actually had on there something along the lines of, we empower and provide jobs for those who are marginalized. Now, for those of you who do not know, every time you buy Ben and Jerry's ice cream and there are brownies inside that ice cream, those brownies were made by an ex-convict. Now, now that you've heard that, what are you going to do? Stop eating Ben and Jerry's? Of course not. The point is, this factory, Greystone Bakeries, are very successful. Why? Because they're giving these criminals and ex-convicts a second chance. They are empowering these people. Think about it. If you do not give them a second chance, what are they going to do? Keep selling drugs, keep selling their daughter's body, keep making child porn. But when you can empower them and treat them like a human being, the dynamics have changed. And the reality is that, in fact, Greystone Bakery are so successful because they believe in these people. The founder was a Buddhist monk, I believe, or he was Buddhist, but they believe in the principle of love. But understand, yes, they have security cameras and metal detectors. Understand that they also fire. But beyond that, they meet the needs just like Jesus did. Even if he healed people, he would feed them too. Greystone bakeries meet the needs. If somebody can't get to work, they will assist them with transportation. If somebody doesn't have a uniform, they will assist them. If childcare is the issue, they will assist them. In the real world, there are some people who cannot work because of childcare issues, because of transport issues. Some of the individuals who sell their bodies, it's because they are only able to do that as a result of X, as a result of Y. Think about it. If you have support, what more can you do? If you have somebody to care for your children, if you have transport to work, if you have counseling, if you have an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting you can attend, if you have support because of your drug addiction, that will change the dynamics of your life. And that is what Greystone Bakery does. They don't just give jobs, they meet the entire needs of their people. And realistically, every one of us has baggages, every one of us needs help. 
every one of us needs help. And therefore, if we get the help, it would give us longevity in our place of work. Think about my situation. Two weeks ago, I quit my job. If my boss had approved me coming to St. Vincent, I would not have quit. Considering the fact that I worked in an organization fighting human trafficking, working in a safe house, and I want to share my message of human trafficking, realistically speaking, she should have endorsed my trip or even gone so far as to pay the trip. When she didn't do that, I had to quit. But if she was able to meet me where I'm at, the dynamics would be different. So that's what we have to consider. Like I keep saying, it is all because of my faith in Jesus Christ that I do what I do. The God I serve believes in second chances. And realistically speaking, every one of us knows a pedophile. Every one of us knows a pedophile. Many of them did not get caught. In the Bible, it talks about when you look at somebody lustfully, you've committed adultery. The word of God says, as a man thinks, so is he. There are many men and even some women who have looked at a girl or boy sexually. They have not done anything, but they have looked at that person sexually. According to the Bible, as a man thinks, so is he. Therefore, if you, according to the Bible, if you have looked at a child sexually or lustfully, you are a pedophile. If you have accidentally seen an image on TV, accidentally, because this sometimes happens, that doesn't make you a pedophile, but you've been exposed to that. And sometimes that exposure opens you up to pedophilia. Now, I know that you've done a lot of work in Asia. Mm -hmm. Now, with a person, a person of Caribbean roots, have you ever thought of maybe coming to one of the islands in the Caribbean and what you intend to do, for example, in the Philippines? That you might want to do the same thing here in the Caribbean? For me, I definitely agree, and I think that would be a fantastic idea. I want to build bakeries around the world. That is first and foremost my dream. I'm a chef. I trained in Switzerland in the United Nations as a chef. My desire is for the bakeries to be everywhere. But first and foremost, for safe houses, the number one priority is the Philippines because it is number one. But the bakeries, absolutely, if I had the funding, if I had a property, land, ingredients, stuff, I would build a bakery wherever I am. That is my passion. I want to make a difference. However, if a country is number one, I have to start there. But of course, if somebody phoned me tomorrow and said, hey, Juanita, I have space, I have land, build a safe house. If there was space and land, then of course I would build a safe house in St. Vincent, in Trinidad. At the end of the day, I go wherever the need is. And if the resources or tools are in a specific location, I will go there. My dream is to be a full-time public speaker. I wish I never had to leave, that I could just hang out in the Caribbean. I've done eight years of this work in Asia. I am not an Asian. I wish I was, I am not, right? So now I'm in the Caribbean, I wanna stay. So if somebody wants to sponsor my flight ticket, please do that, then I can stay. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> now, we'll be coming back with our final segment and we'll be hearing from Miss Hedley exactly what led her to the part that she's currently on. The Caribbean Federation of Police Welfare Associations, or CFPWA, is an amalgamation of police welfare associations around the region, stretching from Bermuda in the north, Belize in Central America, to Guyana in the south. As our motto dictates, unity, professionalism, and equality, we are mandated to deliver quality representation for our colleagues. We are the catalyst for the enhancement and improvement of the relationship between the various associations and our commissioners of police. The CFPWA is committed to its role in regional integration as together we are required to respond to the security requirements of the region while trying to attract the attention of our leaders in CARICOM. We will always advocate for the upgrade and modernizations of our police forces which will in turn enhance our service delivery across the region. The CFPWA holds the conviction that when motivated and modernized, professional police services exist. The quality of service delivery and professionalism will enhance the security on our streets and institutions across the region. The CFPWA is your voice, your choice for unity, professionalism, and equality.
inside And I wanna talk about it Can I trust you on my side? Cause I wanna talk about it Girl, Can you keep a secret? Keep a secret Can you keep a secret? Keep a secret Can you keep a secret? I wanna trust you I wanna trust you So can you keep my secret? You see this road gets tough Gets cold, but still never lose that hope You got everything it takes and more You're not alone in this war Help is on the way every other day You can lean on my shoulders Cause you a superhuman You got my trust and together we can be stronger So we can talk about it Yeah, we can talk about it, yeah So we can talk about it Talk about it, yeah, let's talk about it, yeah I feel lonely deep inside And I wanna talk about it Can I trust you on my side? Cause I wanna talk about it Yo, Can you keep a secret? Keep a secret Can you keep a secret? Keep a secret Can you keep a secret? I wanna trust you I wanna trust you So can you keep my secret? In fact, it's the title of my book, Can You Keep a Secret, which I wrote when I was in Trinidad. I then published it in Ghana and printed in India. So it's very much like the United Nations. Now, I was indeed the unfortunate victim of childhood sexual abuse. And the book trailer you just saw, it depicts some of what I went through. Not everything you see is what happened to me. It's interesting, I was discussing the book trailer with my mother. And she said, oh, I understand what happened. You got abused in the kitchen. And I just laughed. I mean, abuse isn't funny, but what she said is funny because that didn't happen. So I laughed at the fact that she thought my stepfather was touching me sexually in the kitchen. That did not happen. Funny that she said it to me, but not funny because there are children who are groomed when they're learning piano or are groomed when they're in the kitchen or are groomed when they're doing artwork. So, of course, that isn't a funny thing whatsoever. For me personally, I was sexually abused during my sleep. So the scene that you saw there where the door was closing depicts what happened to me. During my sleep, I was sexually abused and I was groomed. Grooming is depicted in the imagery you see, staying up late, being given candy and watching TV. From four to 10, my mother's first husband abused me. I was a victim of attempted rape. Now I disclosed to my mother at four, I said to her, my stepfather was tickling me and his hand slipped. Now, when I told her that we were in Spain at a vacation home and my mother told my stepfather, he ran away, but unfortunately he did return, hence the abuse continued. But when my mother told him off, she then came to me and she said, do not let it happen again. My theory is when it happened again, I did not disclose because she had told me off. She told you, you must let it happen again. That's right. And I got to be clear here. She also told him off. But that is not the point because I am a child. What she should have said is, tell me if it happens again. And then when I was around maybe seven, I asked my cousins, can you keep a secret? 
And they said yes, because they're children, of course they would. I told them my secret. They told their aunt, their mother, my aunt. She told my grandmother. And I remember this very vividly. I was sitting at home and my mom said that your cousins have said you've been abused and we're going to discuss it at your grandma's house. The discussion never happened. Then at 10, the abuse ended or so to speak. The point is the abuse came out multiple times. Now, when I was abused, it was not like you saw in the video. I'm going to say it again. How I was abused was not like in the video, but I'm quite certain that is how some people were abused, quite certainly. I was abused during my sleep. Therefore, as an adult, I still suffer from insomnia because my sleep was disturbed. If there is not a quiet place, quiet, dark space for me to sleep, I will not sleep. I can sleep on a floor. I can sleep with cockroaches, spiders, you name it. I've slept all over the place. A person who works unpaid will sleep on floors and be content. For the last eight years, I've traveled around the world almost like a missionary. So for me, although I have a phobia of spiders, I know how to get over it and when to get over it when it's appropriate. I say that because despite the number of years that pass from the abuse, I still suffer from the effects of insomnia. I've met a lot of people who, having heard my story, have shared about having insomnia and anger issues, insecurities, etc. Now, when I was around maybe 12, my stepfather, my mother used to have a futon bed. My stepfather asked me to engage with him sexually. I will not repeat the words he said. I don't remember exactly, but I knew what he wanted me to do. Now, despite being abused and going to normal girls' school, I was quite naive. But when he asked me to engage, I said no and walked away. That is not always easy for every abuse victim or survivor, but I walked away. When I was being abused from 4 to 10, my mother was in the house downstairs on the telephone. There was a lady who would ring and she talked a lot. So my stepfather knew she'd be occupied for a long time. He'd come upstairs and abuse me. Then he'd go next door, flush the toilet and come downstairs as if he had been in the restroom. My mother had no idea. I have to be clear about it. She was occupied on the phone. And when I asked her subsequently thereafter, she said, I thought he didn't want to listen. Maybe he was on the computer or whatever. These are the days before internet show my age. Then when I was around 15 and a half, I remember that one day I came home. And unlike usual, when I get undressed from school uniform into my day clothes, this occasion, I decided not to get undressed in front of the television. Now, when my stepfather and mum came home, they told me, we saw you watching the TV because they had rigged up the video camera to the television. My mother had gone out and my stepfather said to me, would you like to see the video? So I said yes. And he asked me on the small television or on the big screen. Again, in the old days when we had massive tellies, not flat screens, right? So I said on the small little camera, he turned the video on and cued it. Now I'm looking over his shoulder at the video expecting to see myself. Unfortunately, that is not what I saw. Instead, I saw a video that he had made of himself and my mother having sex. Now I watched it for maybe 30 seconds and I left the room. I fell down and broke my finger. True story, he didn't break it, I broke my finger. Went to hospital the next day. My father asked me, biological of course, if I'd been abused and I denied it. Now, I believe my stepfather showed me that video to groom me. He may have created that video for the purpose of grooming me to engage sexually with him. When I told my mother, I'm sure you can guess her reaction, she told me off. Why did you watch it? The real question is, why did she make it? Now, there are some people who are strong Christians who know the word of God, and it says the marriage bed is not defiled. But I strongly discourage you from making pornography in your marriage because that same porno video can be used to groom your child or somebody else's. So do not be making pornography in your marriage. we got to understand with a lockdown and with people utilizing internet, mobile phones, taking photographs, sex trafficking, cyber sex is on the increase. There was a young girl I heard about. She makes TikTok videos, including some in the shower. Those videos came into the hands of pedophiles. We have to safeguard our kids, the children around us, so that they are not exposed to things. Many children, they act out what they have seen. My stepfather is deceased. He died some years ago. 
I believe that justice will be served in the eyes of the Lord, L-O-R-D, but it was not served in the eyes of the Lord, L-A-W. He never went to court or prison, but I believe that vengeance is God's. So like I said, that video depicts some of what I went through, but more than that, I believe that video enables people to see what grooming may look like. Grooming can be defined in one word, preparation for work, school, or sex. Grooming is when somebody does nice things to you. My stepfather was my best friend. Now, people don't understand that. Remember, I was abused in my sleep. He didn't talk to me. I was sleeping, right? My stepfather gave me candy, special privileges. He was an alcoholic. But it's important to point out, being an alcoholic does not make you a pedophile. It just gave him the courage and confidence to be who he really was. My stepfather was a pedophile. But in the eyes of the Lord, L-O-R-D, he was a human being with a tendency to have sex with children. Now, I don't know if he abused his biological daughter. I don't know if he abused anybody else. But now that he's deceased, the abuse will finally stop. And that's the most important thing. What's the relationship like with your mom after that happened? Truth be told, the reason my stepfather could groom me, the reason why he could take advantage of me, I don't mean when I was sleeping, I mean in the day, the kindness and all, is because despite being an only child, I was not spoiled. I'll say that again. I was not spoiled. I find it very ignorant when people say, oh, you're spoiled. That is nonsense. There are so many only children who are neglected, rejected, forgotten about, abandoned, or abused, and they're the only child. My mother, not a Christian at the time, she believed in the scripture, do not spare the rod. She's a Jamaican. She would beat me if I did something wrong. Hence why I don't agree with corporal punishment, because as a result of her beating me, that enabled my husband to be the nice one, the good cop, bad cop. And on the back of that, the fact that she used to beat me and be very strict, I hated her as a child. I became Christian at 15. As a Christian, I cannot hate, so I disliked her with a passion. I'm just being very honest. Now, my mother, she did not know I was being abused at the time. However, I told her at four, it came out when I was seven. So it's not as though she knew it was happening, but she knew it had happened, and she did not protect me. My family did not protect me. So even into adulthood, there was a lot of anger towards my family, especially my mother. She married a pedophile. I will say that, of course, forgiveness is truly important, and I'm on the journey in the process. It isn't easy, and I advocate forgiveness. With my stepfather, do I have any issue towards him? I really don't know the answer to that because he was my best friend. And when he died and I went to the funeral, I touched the body. I was the only person to give a speech. His daughter and grandson did not. And I cried and said I loved him. Now, I did not know that because he groomed me and abused me. But as the Bible says, out of the wellsprings of the heart the mouth speaks, the truth came out. Do I love my family? I can't answer that question. I don't know. 1 Corinthians 13, I believe, talks about love. Love is something we use very easily. When a girl is being abused, groomed, traffic, the male in the situation, sugar daddy boyfriend says, I love you, have sex with friends. So love is a word we got to be careful with. But I know what the Bible says to me. I know that there's a lot of work that I have to do with myself, but I believe in being honest and transparent. At the end of the day, none of us are perfect. And I know that as a Christian, I have to forgive, I have to love. But I'm being honest, in childhood, I hated her, became Christian, I disliked her. Many of you will be like, really? I'd rather be honest than not. We're all on a journey. Every one of us has baggages. Every one of us has some skeleton in the closet. And I feel that by being honest, people can understand where I'm coming from. I'm on the journey and I want to say one day, you know what? This has happened to me. However, I am completely over it, completely healed in Jesus name. And I can say I truly have forgiven everybody who hurt me and everybody who ignored me because I feel as though as the abuse took place, it was ignored. It was swept under the carpet. And I'm not the only survivor who has felt that way. What advice do you have for young girls and even young boys? that age group who have been abused right now? I would say most definitely that they need to speak out and that is really, really difficult. But I want to flip the switch and say that people need to be available to be spoken to. 
Why is my book called Can You Keep a Secret? Well, number one, when I asked my grandfather and aunt the question, Can You Keep a Secret? They responded, It depends. If you think what I said earlier, when I told my cousins that question, they said yes and I confided. My book is called Can You Keep a Secret? Because I want to educate people that when someone asks you that question or a different variation, is it confidential? Is it going to stay in the room? Will it stay between us? They want to tell you something. So for example, imagine that seven-year-old I mentioned earlier, Daddy is eating my cookie. When she comes up to you and says, can you keep a secret? When you say no or it depends, she will keep on walking. Let's try that again. Can you keep a secret? Yes. And then she would say, Daddy is eating my cookie. Then you would say, for example, I have to break your trust and phone the police. You do not phone the accused. For example, I heard you've been sexually abusing your daughter. He's going to deny it and hide the evidence. Back in the old days, children were sexually abused. Nowadays, children are sexually abused and the abuser makes money. How? He or she sells photos on the dark web. When you respond appropriately to that question, yes, that child, young person or adult will confide in you their secret. Once you've heard it, you decide what to do, then you communicate your steps and then take them. For example, can you keep a secret? Yes, I have a bomb. Then you say, because you have a bomb, I have to call the bomb squad. I have to be very clear because adults overcomplicate it. It is not complicated. You say yes to hear the secret. Once you've heard it, decide what to do. Communicate those steps first and then do it. Because when a person opens up to you, they want your help. And they might be angry and frightened now and not speak to you. But 10, 20, 30 years later, when they're healthy and whole, they'll come back and thank you. Therefore, for a child to be able to disclose, it requires you to respond appropriately. We don't want people to be causing confusion, back and out gossip. When you hear something, you need to respond appropriately. Do not discuss it with your friends, with the elder. I know of a young girl who was abused in Trinidad by a pastor. It came out and the discussion was had with the victim, survivor and the pastor and he denied it. Obviously, this is ridiculous. Let the police have the conversation. Now I say this because despite the statement I have just made, and if you pay attention, you're saying yes to hear the secrets, you're communicating you're gonna break that secret, and then you do break the secret by calling the cops. Despite the fact I say this all the time, Every time I do a presentation, somebody comes up to me, texts me, whatsapps me and says, I was abused. And when they tell me that, if they're currently being abused, they know I'm going to say to them, I have to break your trust and phone the police, but people are crying out for help. It's important for children to have a safe space to speak. I encourage children to speak out, but it isn't easy. I will provide my contact information before we go today so people can reach out to me, but I'm only here short term. At the end of the day, death is around the corner. Well, not that close, but you know what I mean, right? I won't be here forever and eventually I'll die. The point is, we've got to take the baton. We have a responsibility. It is very, very difficult to disclose that you've been abused. There's shame, the stigma, the blame, and all of that. But if a child, young person, or adult has been a victim, You've got to speak up. It is hard, but even if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for the next victim. I've heard of people who've been abused, said nothing, and as a result, their brother got abused, their sister or cousin. Some of you may have heard of the case of Khadija in Sierra Leone. Her uncle is alleged, it's alleged her uncle had raped and she died. And the uncle, his mother, wanted to bury Khadija. From what I have read, Khadija had documentation to go to the US and be with her father, but due to some delays, she had been in Sierra Leone. What I had read is that her sister had also been raped, but when Khadija died, that's when it all came out. There was an uproar. People got angry and were incensed by it. Now, when I heard the case, people wanted to name and shame the uncle. Now, for me personally, I don't see how that is helpful because my concern, when they name and shame the uncle, there are people who believe that skinny Sierra Leone men are rapists. Uncles in Sierra Leone are rapists. We don't need to name and shame. There are rapists right next door. We just don't know it. At the end of the day, people are people. Like 
I said before, naming and shaming will not stop another man raping a seven-year-old or six-year-old girl in Sierra Leone. That does not solve the problem. We need to be a society where we speak up and protect one another. We've got to be our brother's keeper, and that is important. It is hard to talk about abuse, and I know that. But if you think a child has been abused, ask them questions. When I talk to children and they message me, I try to inquire why they're reaching out. But there's a way of doing it. What I do, because everybody knows my slogan, I ask them, do you have a secret? That's my slogan. Or I ask them questions one to five. For example, has anybody taken photographs of you with no clothes on? Has anybody hit you? Has anybody? And when I ask these simple yes or no's, it is a lot easier for them to disclose because it is a yes or a no. Now think about it. When my dad asked me when I was 15, have you been abused? I said no. But if he had been more specific, has your stepfather ever come into your room when you were sleeping? If he'd been more specific with a question that is easier to respond to, I may have said yes. If he asked me, has your stepfather ever come into your room and whatever, for example, come into your room and got into your bed? It may not be so easy for me to communicate with words, but my body language, my lack of eye contact would speak volumes. Because on one occasion, I remember waking up and my stepfather was sleeping beside me because he snores very loudly and of course I had insomnia at that time. And I went downstairs and I communicated to my mother. She was sleeping, the couch was in front of the door. I communicated to her, he was sleeping in my bed. She opened her eyes, looked to me, went back to sleep. She denies that ever happened. I remember it like it was yesterday. They'd obviously had an altercation. He was drunk and he got into my bed. When she didn't do anything to protect me because she was asleep, what I did instead is I went into her bedroom and slept on the wicker chair. However, because we did not have CSI back in the day, I did not realize the importance of that situation because if I had understood and known about crime scene investigation, I could have called the police and there would have been sufficient evidence of him being in my bed. Now, so, can you keep a secret when you ask a child? Mm -hmm. It's not really for you to keep that secret out. Uh-uh. So what you do, you analyze exactly what the child tells you. Yes. And then you make a decision whether or not you're going to keep that secret. Yeah. Uh, tell that secret to someone else. Yes. So that that person can get help. That's right. Now, you also mentioned about naming and shaming is not might not be the way to really and truly solve a matter. Mm -mm. Now, um, we've had some discussions here. I know in Saint Vincent about getting a sexual offenders registry. Mm -hmm. And some persons might believe that that might be the best thing to do so that you can know exactly who is living, where, what they might have done, the mm -hmm. least of the persons. But, and there are some persons who will say that having a registry will not stop the person from committing sexual offenses. Mm -mm. What's your opinion? I was going to ask you the same question. Well, first of all, if we think about it logically, now hear this carefully, because back home we have something called DBS or CRB, which is a background check. Now, my stepfather would have passed a background check because he was never caught for what he did. In the same way, the issue with having a sexual offenses registry is that it will make you feel safe, for example, to avoid Tom or Harry. Avoid Tom or Harry, you'll be safe, but you'll trust that your child can stay with Errol or Leroy or, or Anthony, if that makes sense. And so that's the issue because when you inform people, Tom and Harry are pedophile, their guard is up, but their guard is down with the pedophiles who never got caught. And that is the issue. And then the other problem, when we have a registry, like in the US when we have registries, people throw eggs at his door. People call him or her name, usually it's a him, call him names, like defecate on the street in front of them and do terrible things to that person. Now, as a result of doing that, what sometimes happens, because you have been stigmatized so badly, you find comfort in watching child pornography. When you treat them like a normal human being away from the safety of your children and rehabilitate them back into society, they wouldn't need to go back into the comfort of the child pornography. Now understand, I'm gonna say it again, treating them normal but away from children. 
So spending time with them in safe places where there are no kids. They are human beings. When we find out that a person is a pedophile, what are we going to do? Hang out with them? Of course not. We're going to stigmatize them, ostracize them outside of society. And what about those men who are pedophiles because that is all they know? I know of a young girl who was sexually abused by her mother. The boyfriend wanted photographs. This is a UK case. Now that girl was six months old. If she is abused until 18, that is her normal. So when she abuses her child, yes, that is a crime and she's a pedophile, but that is her normal. What about the adopted boy I mentioned with the two dads? He was abused and sold, well, not sold with money, but trafficked and sold without cash being exchanged multiple times. That is all he knows. So therefore, when he goes in to commit the same crime, is there any surprise? We're not endorsing the behavior, but some of these pedophiles are victims. When you go and say, Tom at number six is a pedophile, how's that helpful? At the end of the day, there should be rules in place. Therefore, Mr. X and Mrs. Y who are pedophiles cannot live in this neighborhood. And it's only them who know that. For example, do not live in Kingstown, live in Sandy Bay, live in Layou, for example. And that is only between the pedophiles and probation, the pedophiles and the judge. So the pedophiles have restrictions, they know the restrictions, maybe give them an electronic tag if needs be, but I don't think the whole of society needs to know because the challenge is you will feel safe when you are not near Tom and Harry. Sorry, when you're away from Tom and Harry, you're feeling safe. When you're with Uncle Herbert or whoever, you're, you're knowing I'm okay. My kids can stay with Uncle Herbert when they're going to get abused right here. So that's the problem. Your guard is lowered. And the vast majority of children who are abused are abused by somebody they know. So when you say, stay away from Mr. Blocks down the road, but so-and-so is okay. So-and-so is the pedophile, but never got caught. Think about it. When my mother didn't disclose, when my grandmother didn't disclose, my stepfather could sexually abuse other children, and maybe he did. So therefore, he would pass a background check. Therefore, he would be able to move amongst the community of kids and keep re-abusing. When we sweep it under the carpet, as is happening in the Caribbean and Africa, that pedophile will keep abusing and we won't know. And the sexual registry makes us feel comfortable that we can trust that person when in fact their infractions are a lot worse than the one who got caught. Now, why are you here as an intermediate? You said you've been to Trinidad and mm -hmm. Jamaica and a couple of other places, but why did you choose St. Vincent? Truthfully, if you want the truth, the whole Vincent truth, and nothing, but the and nothing but the truth for a husband. No joking. <laughs> 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 joke only, joke. I just find it really funny to say that I'm only kidding, trust me. God's timing, not mine. No, what it is really, back in around April, I was invited to speak via Zoom for a program at the Wesleyan Holiness Church in Camden Park. Now, I have a gift of prophecy. I'm not a prophet, but I have a gift of prophecy. And the Bible says there's life and death in the tongue. And sometimes, people in general, we forget the power we have with our words. Sometimes I speak things into existence. Not the husband, as you can tell, but I speak things into existence. And so back in April, during the lockdown, I said, I'm coming to St. Vincent. And I'm here. At the end of the day, the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will grant your heart's desire. Despite there being a lockdown, despite having a full-time job, despite my boss saying, you cannot come to St. Vincent, we will not approve it. I quit my job Friday, booked my flight Saturday and left on Wednesday. When God has a plan for you, the plan will come to fruition. I got here and by the grace of God, 32 hours later, I was virus free and was able to move about. I came here for a Zoom program, but the blessing is I've been able to do so much prior to the program on Friday, 4th of September. It has been a blessing to be here, as I said, and I keep saying it because my words have power, as do all of us. Even the atheists know that there are power in our words. I would like to stay longer, not just here, but in the Caribbean in general. For the last five years, I've been going to Trinidad and Tobago doing the same kind of work, but with the current situation, next January may not happen. At the end of the day, my message is important. I love what I do. I love to speak on trafficking. I find it fun. When I do presentations, it's like a performance. For some of you who do not know, 
In the US, criminal lawyers often go to acting school. It's all about who has the most theatrical story in the courtroom, but don't quote me on that. So for me, when I give my presentations, it's like I'm on stage. It's like I'm performing. I absolutely love it. I may not be paid to do it, but I love what I do. And so I decided to come out here. My birthday was August 27th. I've celebrated abroad for the last 10 years. I wanted to go to a new country. I wanted to have the chance to educate people. And I wanted to have the opportunity to make my mark. Now, it is not about my name. It is not about changing cases. It is all about Jesus. And he provides opportunities for me to spread the message. The Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is important. And I came here not just to celebrate my birthday and go on the beach, but to do what I love. And that's to educate and educating to protect children, young people, and individuals who are most at risk of exploitation and or abuse. Now, between now and September 10th, when you are scheduled to leave... Nice choice of words, scheduled. scheduled to leave, <laughs> what are some of the engagements that, that you might have already planned? I actually have some programs coming up on Wednesday, which will be tomorrow, Wednesday at 6 p.m., Kingstown Baptist Church, I have a program which people are welcome to join. And then on Thursday, I'm collaborating with the Superintendent Junior Simmons. We'll be doing a program at Wilson Hill, and that is the New Testament Church of God. That's on Thursday. So 6 p.m., Kingston Town Baptist Church, which is on Wednesday. On Thursday, this week, Thursday the 3rd of September, I'll be doing a program at Wilson Hill. Wilson Hill, New Testament Church of God. These are opportunities for people to come to hear the message that I have, to be educated, empowered. I've spoken so far at another church previously. I've had some platforms via radio and online, but I'm looking for more opportunities. I speak every day, seven days a week. My message is important. Whether I leave on the 10th or stay, it's besides the point. Currently scheduled, nice choice of words, scheduled for the 10th, exactly. Things can change, but I'd rather make the most of the time that I have. Whether I stay or not, I still have 10 days or so to go. And I feel that this message needs to get further out. Five years in Trinidad and Tobago, there's still a lot of people who have not heard my message. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a lot smaller, which means I should be able to have a greater impact and a further reach. I also want to point out that during my program tomorrow, Wednesday, 6 p.m., Kingstown Baptist Church, and Thursday, 7 p.m., at Wilson Hill New Testament Church of God, I'll be selling my book and t-shirts. They are 70 EC 70. Why 70? Because 60, 60, 60 percent of profits go to charity for building the safe houses in the Philippines. Now, as you heard, I said it many a time, I quit my job to be here. That means I don't get a lot of money back from the book, but I'm okay with that. I have a desire to help and to change lives. Every book that is sold, 60% of the money is going to a good course. So please do reach out to me if you want to get a copy of my book to attend my program. These are important messages that need to be shared. The book has my personal story, my testimony. It provides advice and guidance on how to respond to Can You Keep a Secret? and how to identify victims and survivors in your world. Because what many of us don't realize, even adults who were abused 10, 20, or 30 years earlier, they sometimes, sometimes, important word, sometimes still have the dysfunctions that were in them as a child. Anger issues, low self-esteem, insomnia. When we see individuals who are dysfunctional, low self-esteem, whatever, that could be because of abuse in their childhood. And I'm going to go one step further and say that on occasion, there are men, on too many occasions, men who beat up their wives, partners, or girlfriends. That is not okay. That is domestic violence. It's abuse. But in some, some instances, the reason he beats his wife is because he has anger issues that stems from childhood sexual abuse. I have met many women with anger issues and they were abused in their childhood. What about the men with anger issues who take it out on their partner? I'm not justifying, I'm just explaining. When we can understand something, we can understand a person, we can get them the help that they need. 
These programs are important. I want people to attend. I'm very blessed and grateful that Superintendent Junior Simmons has been such a great help in opening up opportunities for me to share. In fact, the first speaking I had was organized by him through a church on my birthday, August 27th, and it was an honor to have had that opportunity. So I'm very grateful for all he's done. And he too and others will be at the event on Thursday, 7 p.m., Wilson Hill, New Testament Church of God, and Wednesday, 6 p.m., Kingstown Baptist Church. Well, Miss Juanita Headley, I must thank you very much for being here with us and uh, the police program. It's called KS Law Protect. And um, it was certainly a pleasure to have you here explaining exactly child abuse, and especially sexual abuse in children, also human trafficking, and especially human trafficking when it comes to children. And overall, your experiences, as you said, 38 countries um, around the world that you've been to, mostly in Asia, you've traveled a lot, the US, the UK, and now your journey in the Caribbean, um, apart from Trinidad, has started. And I do hope um, you can achieve your goals. And um, for this, um, my Oswell technician on the other side, I know you have a lot of lands in the Dominic Hall of side. Yeah, that friendly scene over there. And maybe um, we can get a piece donated to you so you can have a bakery. Amen. Um, in Jesus' name. Definitely. And, um, <laughs> I can't really bake there, but um, I can help folks. I can supervise. I'm excited. Right? I already have land and a team. I'm not leaving September 10th. Right. Definitely. <laughs> so um, lands are coming. Um, we must have, we must get something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so I'm sure a pleasure having you here tonight. And um, I wish you all the best for the rest of your engagement here in St. Vincent and Grandines. And even when you leave St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. And that maybe one of these days you can be seen here once again to speak to us. And I must apologize for not having season seven days here tonight in the program. Um, she's a bit under the weather. Um, wishing her a speedy recovery. And uh, our viewers, I thank very much for keeping up with us for the past uh, two or so hours and um, until next until Thursday yes we'll be having this Thursday come in which is our regular um, case of protect program night we should be having ESP Junior Simmons along with uh, Commissioner of Police Mr. Colin John oh before I go can I give my contact information definitely, definitely. that'd be great if people would like to contact me to invite me to speak or if they would like to attend the programs my contact number is 454-1693, 454-1693. My Facebook name is Changing Cases, Changing, C-A-S-E-S, -E -S, Changing Cases. My website is changingcases.org. Again, my number, 454-1693, 454-1693. And finally, I just want to thank, again, Superintendent Junior Simmons for organizing the programs. And also, Pastor Ferdinand, who has blessed us with the church at Wilson Hill, which is New Testament Church of God, just for opening that up to us. Finally, just to thank my host, Mandisa Stevens, who has been a tremendous blessing, providing me with wonderful, tasty vegan food. Not just plants, but chunks as well, so I'm very grateful because I do like my protein. And of course, Mr. Games from Games Book Center. For those who'd like a copy of the book, Can You Keep a Secret?, which is here, the book is available 7070 EC at Mr. Games Bookstore. He has been a tremendous help to me. He's my bodyguard, PA, uncle in the Lord, accountability partner, lunch companion. He has been the best thing that could ever happen to me in this island. And I'm truly grateful for all that he has done. He has been waiting so patiently for me to do this program so he can go home. He'll be getting up super early in the morning to drive me to my next program. And just a week ago, we were complete strangers. So I'm ever so grateful. I know that he is a blessing to your country and your nation. And he has been a blessing to me too. And I really have to say I love him dearly because you know what? Life is here today, gone tomorrow. And it's no sense we all get together at each other's funeral and say how great we are. So I really just want to give a shout out to him and for those who've helped me. I don't need to mention names, but I'm really grateful for those who invited me for lunch, took me to the beach, hang out with me on my birthday. I'm ever so grateful. So again, you can reach out to me, 454-1693, if you'd like to invite me to speak or to attend the program Wednesday, Kingstown Baptist Church, 6 p.m. And Thursday, 7 p.m., Wilson Hill, New Testament Church of God, 454-1693. Thank you very much, Miss Juanita Headley. And a good night to you, Facebook viewers.
Join in the plan. Walk hand in hand. Come on. Join in the plan. Walk hand in hand. Come on. A beautiful nation and trust in your care. Love and protection make them live without fear. Fellow policemen, extend a helping hand. Fellow policemen, we serve you anywhere. Join in the plan. Come on. Sometimes you want it direct, straight from the source. Who that? Police, boy, blow. Oh, so you is the Babylon book that is causing disruption in the domestic affairs.